Good morning, everybody. Delighted to see that all of you got up on this wonderful Saturday morning to come and join us. I know that there are lots of uh, possibilities like sleeping in. Um, so we're really delighted to see you. We are going to have a program today that will cover all of the programs that we offer here at the Journalism School. Um, I sh should say first um, that my name is Christine Souders. I'm the Dean for Admission and Financial Aid. Um, we have a whole host of speakers who will be talking with you this morning um, and we will take short breaks at different points in the program so that you can ask questions. We also have a live, st uh, live stream of what we're doing today, so I know that there are people who are listening in from all over the world. We also welcome you. Um, but we'll be having faculty who are going to be speaking today. Sheila Coronel, our Dean for Academic Affairs, is going to start things off. We'll have a faculty panel that will include Elena Cabral, who is uh, the director of the part-time MS program, Betsy West, who is a documentary and broadcast faculty member who will talk generally about the MS program, Nick Lemon, um, a faculty member who runs uh, the politics seminar of the MA program, is going to speak generally about the MA program, he is also our um, former dean. Um, and then we'll move from that to a student panel so that you'll be able to talk to people who are actually right in the thick of it um, now. Then we'll have Gina Bubion from the Career Services Office to talk about the kinds of things that we offer our students in terms of career services assistance, um, both while they're here and after they've graduated. Um, and then I will talk about admissions, the application process, financial aid, scholarships, that sort of thing. We'll take questions at the break in each session, or after each section. Please feel free to ask all sorts of questions. The person next to you is asking him or herself the same question, I guarantee you. So don't uh, feel like a question is unreasonable or perhaps um, crazy, um, they are not. If you have questions, we would ask you to come. We have a microphone in the center aisle, at the back of the center aisle. We would ask you to go to the microphone, speak into it clearly, um, again, so that our live stream audience can hear the questions as well. Live stream audience, my colleague Taryn Almanzar, our Director of Financial Aid and Admissions is running the live stream chat. You can also chat with her and um, send questions in via that chat session and she'll be answering you directly. Okay, next I'd like to introduce Sheila Coronel, our Dean for Academic Affairs and also the Director of the Stabil Program in Investigative Journalism. Sheila. Thank you, Christine. Good morning, everyone. I'm sure you're here because you know that journalism is the most exciting profession in the world, <laughs> and that uh, this is an exciting and transformative time to be a journalist. Journalism is being reinvented. There are now new ways of telling stories, of gathering information, of producing um, and disseminating news and information to a broad and global public. This I dare say there has been no more exciting time to be a journalist. There, it is a time for reinvention. Old models are dying. New ones are being built in this place. And if you go into the profession at this time, you will have a chance to remake it in your own image and vision. At the, we are a 100-year-old journalism school. We are very steeped in the traditions of journalism of storytelling, of providing information in the public interest. But we, are also, we have also, in recent years, uh, made very big steps towards innovation, 
towards thinking about how journalism is going to be done in a digital and global world. We have a diverse student body. We have a diverse faculty. We have an array of classes that are meant to hone you in reporting, in writing, for those in the, MA program, in the MS program, reporting, writing, video production, photography, and audio. For those in the MA program, we have some of the best professors teaching deep subject matter reporting that will hone your expertise in such subjects as politics, arts and culture, the environment, and business. Our PhD program, how many of you here are interested in our PhD program? That's great. So we have a robust faculty with distinguished alumni. Andy Tucker will be here later to take you, sorry, get, take you out of the room and give you a more in-depth briefing. How many of you are, are interested in the MS program? Fantastic. For those in the MS program, New York will be your laboratory. There is no better place to learn journalism than New York, which is a diverse, global, dirty, big, uh, interesting, let's say, city. How many of you are in the, interested in the MA program? Huh, that's great. So uh, the MA program is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. And over the years, if you look down the hall here, you will see a photo exhibit uh, that was created by one of the recent graduates of our MA program, Ben Taub. He did those photographs. And the story that was his master's project was published in The New Yorker not long after his graduation. We, this is a place where you can raise your game, wherever you are at the stage of your career, whether you are a beginning journalist with one or two years experience, whether you are from somewhere else, some other profession on the other side of journalism. We've had students here who were lawyers, nurses, doctors from, from the military. Do we have any um, army veterans here? Yes, that's great, welcome. Well, we've had over the years a good number of, of veterans from you know, the Army, the, the, uh, and they have been a great addition to our student body. I myself have had uh, veterans who were in my class, and it's been amazing to, uh, to see them in the classroom, take part, and engage the rest of our students in, in discussions about where the country is going, where journalism is going, what is the mission of journalism? We also have um, people who've had you know, both no experience as well as some experience in journalism, and it's a great mix. Uh, there is no formula to what makes for a good journalist. You come here and you learn, and you choose what direction of journalism you want to go into. Journalism has a place for everybody. What we give you is a set of skills, a way of looking at things, perspective of journalism as a global profession, as a profession in great flux that's being transformed before our very eyes and where our voices can find a place. So thank you very much for being here. Welcome to the Journalism School. If you have any questions at all, please free to send me an email. My email is scoronel, S-C-O-R-O-N-E-L, at columbia.edu. I can answer your questions about our academic programs. And for those of you, any of you interested here in investigative reporting? Yes, fantastic. So feel free to get in touch with me and to set up a meeting. Feel free to drive. Over the past weeks, I've had people dropping into my class. For those others of you who are in New York and you want to drop into any of our classes, please feel free to do that. Uh, the admissions office will help arrange um, those interactions for you so you can see what life is like in our classrooms and see how we teach and the kind of interaction that our professors have with our students. We have very small classes. Typically our classes are 15 and 16 students. The, in the industry right now, there's so much um, flux going on that you rarely, editors now no longer have the time to give you the kind of intensive one-on-one -on -one mentoring that we provide you here in the classroom. If people ask you, why do you need to be in journalism school? It's because it is a crash course in the fundamentals, the ethics, and the world of journalism 
a crash course, uh, something that you will get maybe if, a few, if you ha spend a few years in journalism, but increasingly editors no longer have the bandwidth to be able to provide you the skill set, the mentoring, the guidance, and the ethical moorings that journalism in this complex world requires. So thank you again for being here. Feel free to be in touch and enjoy the rest of the morning. Thanks very much, Sheila. Next, I'm going to invite Professor Andy Tucker to join us. She is the director of the PhD program. Um, and she will talk with just very briefly about the PhD program. And um, then those of you who are interested in that can go with her to another room. I just wanted to mention that we've got um, people listening in on the live stream from Canada, from Nigeria, from Japan, the Philippines. Um, and also from Malaysia and from a number of states here in the United States. So welcome to all of you. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Professor Andy Tucker. Thank you, Christine. And I'm delighted to see you all here. I just want to talk for a very few minutes to all of you. I'm going to take those of you interested in the communications PhD program to a separate room. It's a very different program. The admissions policies are different. The program is very different. So we're going to talk specifically about that. But in order to make sure that you've come to the right session, and also just so that you don't think that we're some kind of cabal going off and plotting in secret, I wanted to tell just briefly about what the PhD program is. It's an academic, scholarly, traditional PhD program that looks at various aspects of technological, economic, social, political, cultural, historical elements of the production and exchange of information in society. It, it's a traditional academic PhD program. What it's not is super duper advanced journalism. It's not a journalism program. You don't do hands on. What, it's an interdisciplinary program. Students have access to almost any graduate course in the entire university. They put together an individual plan of study. They usually take two or three years of coursework and then several years beyond that for a dissertation. They are interested in topics like um, the fact-checking universe in the new digital world, um, online political participation and partisanship the uh, fake news and political narrative, the history of posing in photography. So that's the kind of thing that, that, that our group does. So if any of you are interested in exploring that further, please come with me. We'll go upstairs and we'll talk more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, I would next like to invite our faculty panel to come to join us. Um, and they're each going to talk a little bit about the different master's programs. Um, so they'll be talking about the Master of Science, both the part-time and the full-time program. Also our dual degree programs. Um, we have dual degree programs with a number of departments and divisions here at Columbia University, including computer science. Um, the law school, the business school, the School of International and Public Affairs, and the religion department at um, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And we also have two international dual degree programs, one with the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa, and the second with Sciences Po in Paris. So interesting opportunities also for combining um, interdisciplinary interests that you might have. Um, I'm also just going to mention that there is food at the back. Um, one of the things, one of the hallmarks of the journalism school is eating. Um, and so I expect that all of you are going to have a bite and help us clean that food up, although I can guarantee you that our students will come in after you if you don't finish it. Okay, I'd like to start first with Betsy West, um, who's going to talk about the MS program. The Hi, everybody, and uh, hi to our live stream viewers. Uh, I just wanted to, to say to them that I think now close to 40%, is that right now, of yes. our students are international students. So uh, we have a very diverse and global uh, student body here now. So anyway, yes, I'm Betsy West. and. Um, for many years, I was a network news producer and a documentary 
producer and director, and I still do documentaries, but I've been at the journalism school teaching now for about 10 years. And I have to say that you're joining a uh, wonderful community of um, both uh, professional journalists and then our students who go on to be professional journalists. So you, you wind up being part of this, this great group and uh, there's nothing that I love more than to hear from my students and to hear, hear what they're doing. Uh, let me start, uh, start off and just describe for you our MS program, which we revamped several years ago to reflect some of the changes that are going on in the industry and the impact of technology, and also to emphasize the core that we believe in here in the journalism school, which is reporting and um, getting at the getting at the truth and, and figuring out how to find stories and how to tell those stories in the most engaging way. So we have uh, uh, you come in in August. This is one of the one of the the new um, parts of our our program, and we have a very intense. Uh, boot camp in which you're getting um, uh, beginning digital skills, photography and audio skills in August and starting your work on reporting. Um, in, for the first seven weeks of the program in September, you are in a very intense reporting class and uh, in which you are using, as Dean Cornell said, New York City is your laboratory and you will be assigned to a variety of beats depending on your professor and how they organize the class, uh, assigned to beats in New York City and you're going out and you're finding stories. And that's uh, the most uh, challenging and exciting part, I think, uh, at the very beginning. Uh, some of you may have already been reporters, but some people are coming to this from different professions or just getting out of uh, college and aren't used to it. And um, it really is a, a kind of uh, apprenticeship, I think, as uh, Dean Coronel said. And um, this is to emphasize um, our belief in, uh, in the core of the school, which is reporting. After the seven weeks, then you start to get some options. and. Uh, you have to take a writing module, mm -hmm. but we have a variety of writing modules. So you could take um, uh, more long form writing, uh, I think you can take writing for broadcast, a whole series of options of writing, writing modules. And you can also take a, um, uh, what do we call it, an audio visual, uh, a image, uh, and image and sound <laughs> module. So I teach video in the image and sound module. And this is when people start, those of you who've already, I don't know how many people already shoot are doing uh, video and interested in that. So for those of you who've already been doing video, we uh, administer a test and people go into an advanced video class. We have a lot of students who just have never picked up a camera before and that's when they start. And by the end of the year, you know, some of them are making documentaries. Uh, so that is the, uh, that's the uh, second half of the fall semester. You may take an audio course, uh, and there are also uh, the, our, our new, um, really new emphasis also on data and opportunities to take um, data mm -hmm. uh, courses. In the spring, which is really January, it's not really the spring, but we call it the spring, <laughs> starts in January, uh, you will be taking a, um, uh, 15 week, two 15 week workshops. And this is really, we've gotten rid of concentrations. We allow you to kind of form your own concentration. That's, that's one of the big differences in our new curriculum. So depending on what you are interested in, some people discover photography in the fall and they've never picked up a camera before but they decide that's really what they want to do. So you take longer workshops in the fall. You're also working on your master's project which is a, a capstone project can be either solely print a, a long form piece of reporting or it can be a um, combination of uh, long form and a uh, have a digital component to it. So that master's project is due in uh, March and then um, the program ends in, in May. Uh, we also, I, I teach in the documentary program, so for anyone here interested in doc? So 
the way the documentary program works is that you come in and you're like a, an MS student. You go into a reporting class and you're basically going along. But we have a special documentary uh, advisory in the fall for you to start thinking about what documentary you might want to do. And then we have um, a documentary seminar in the spring. And then the documentary students stay on for an additional semester, either the summer or the fall, to do a half hour documentary. So right now, we actually have students who are finishing from the 15 class, they're finishing their documentaries. And then we have this whole new cohort are coming in and starting the documentary program. We have a fantastic doc fest in uh, December where we show the films. I just heard yesterday that one of the films from last year has been bought by the New York Times for NewYorkTimes.com. We're going to be in, we have three films that will be in Doc NYC in that festival this fall. So, um, you know, people are doing uh, real professional work in the documentary program. Um, so that's, that's the MS program. Did I miss something, I don't Christine? Think so. yeah. I don't think so. Well, I'd like to next introduce Professor Elena Cabral, who is the director of the part-time program. Can you give us an idea how many of you might be interested in part-time study in the MS program? Great. Thank you. Great, it's uh, great to see all of you here. I am the director of the part-time program, but I'm also a graduate of the part-time program. I graduated in 99 uh, and went on to work for the Miami Herald. Um, I uh, gravitated back to the journalism school when my work brought me back to New York City. And I think that it's a, a testament to the uh, a very common experience among our grads to think of Columbia as an intellectual home, place that you sort of like come back to and interact with for the rest of your professional life. It's not like college where you make your best friends in life. This is where you, you really establish your professional family and you should think of that investment as a lifelong investment because for me it really has been. I came back to teach um, and to uh, freelance and to run this program. Another part of my job involves working in career services and you'll hear in a moment about about all of the uh, services that we provide in that department. Uh, but it's a wonderful combination because it allows me to see the whole life cycle of a student here from the very beginning uh, all the way to uh, the end when we have a terrific career expo, the biggest one anywhere, and help to match students with uh, some really exciting jobs that aren't like the ones that uh, were around when I started uh, journalism school. And everybody knows that I'm very partial to the part-time program, and not just because I am a graduate, but also because, frankly, for me, it is the best way to get the absolute most out of this school over a two-year period, and not just in terms of classes, but in terms of all the things that go on in this building. At any, on any given day, there's some fantastic speaker, newsmaker in the building, um, workshops, uh, events to help you sharpen your resume. And you know, once you get in the door, I think the hardest part for any student, whether it's full-time or part-time, is just deciding, you know, uh, which to pick, and because there's never really any uh, enough time in the day. And um, speaking of time, the way that the part-time program is designed, it's really to enable someone like myself coming right out of school, not really wanting to leave my job um, and take on a huge amount of debt for a full-time full student, uh, to continue to work. Um, and to take classes essentially one at a time, one semester at a time. The program is stretched out over six semesters, so it's a summer, fall, and spring, and then another summer, fall, and spring. During most of those semesters, you're taking just one class, but you're not sort of a separate siloed student. You are mixed in with, the, with all of the students, and all of the classes are available to you. I think that I would stress that it's not an, a, a, a night school. Uh, the flexibility comes in being able to stretch out those classes, but you really should have some time in your work week. And in journalism, you know, stories never work out perfectly where you can only report them at night and on weekends and, you know, during your lunch hour. So you do have to expect that, you know, there would be uh, daytime uh, business hours uh, that would be demanded of you. Uh, but having said that, uh, it does give an enormous amount of flexibility. And it also offers the chance for some of you who are career changers to take advantage of this wonderful student status that you are now having again after college that makes you eligible. 
eligible for scholarships, uh, fellowships, internships, and our part-timers get to, uh, when they can, take advantage of these internships in the media capital of the world. A lot of the times when our full-timers and many of the full-timers uh, at schools around the city are not able to. So those are those run year-round because, um, you know, news agencies don't close over the, uh, over the summer. So, uh, you know, we encourage our part-time students to make use of the Career Services Office to look for those opportunities. Um, but it is very much the same degree that the, uh, the full-timers uh, receive, but it just has a few little benefits. And I'm happy to talk uh, about those with you uh, after this session um, and make an appointment with you to come in and visit me in the Career Services Office, take a tour of the building, sit in on some classes. Next, Nick Lemon is going to speak with us about the MA program. Okay, the Master of Arts program, uh, we started, um, as, as Sheila mentioned, 10 years ago. And the original idea was that it would be kind of an optional second year at the school. The Master of Science program, as Betsy mentioned, really focuses on um, professional orientation and journalism skills, uh, primarily. And, and to the extent that people find a, a specialization, it tends to be a skills specialization like documentary, data, investigative, etc. Uh, the Master of Arts program is designed not to teach skills, but to assume that people have skills already and uh, to focus on reporting on difficult subjects um, with real confidence and flair. Um, so our categories are not you know, video, data, digital, et cetera. Our categories are by subject matter. Um, po they're for politics, science, which includes medicine, health, environment. Politics is not just elective politics, it's kind of anything humans do when they gather more than individually. Um, <laughs> so it includes, you know, religion and, and, and um, social organizing and lots of other things. Um, arts and culture is the third major. Um, and the fourth major is business and economics. So when you apply to our program, you apply into one of these majors. Um, the way it's evolved over the years is the MA, very few people sequence from the MS to the MA, although we love it when they do. The MA tends to draw a different population. Um, it's a median age is two or three years older. It's often people who are already working in, in, in the news business, but want to sort of empower themselves. Um, as somebody who was intimately involved in starting the program, I can say that the test for me was um, pretty simple, which is, uh, you know, I'm a working journalist and have been for uh, longer than anybody in this room has been alive. Um, and I still have, am an active, you know, long form print journalist, mostly at the New Yorker. Um, the test is, if it's, if it makes you a better journalist, but you can't turn to the person next to you in the newsroom and say, can you explain this to me? We teach it here. Um, so, uh, if I say to Betsy, you know, how do you cut a documentary, she can answer that. If I say, work out the implications of the Fed raising interest rates now mm -hmm. versus December, yeah. So we're going to get you over that hurdle. I, I often found in my younger days as a journalist, I'd feel sort of stuck uh, on, on the, the ability to take on complicated subjects. Um, so that's what we're trying to get you over. Um, often you'll hear, if you want to learn a subject, don't go to a journalism school, go to the School of Public Affairs, the business school, at someplace else in the university. We think there's a real value to teaching these things in the journalism school. We bring in many professors, including some of the most eminent at Columbia, from elsewhere to us uh, to help us teach them. First of all, it's a shorter form degree. You know, most of these other degrees are two, three years long. But second and most important, we're, um, if you study at another school, you're doing what in the business school they call B2B communications, business to business or expert to expert. You're writing term papers and doing PowerPoints and so on. 
we perform the act of translation from complicated subjects into actual journalism in real time in the school. Um, so that's, that's the, the, the clear you know, value and uniqueness of this program. Um, our student body is very international. Uh, the politics concentration this year in which I teach is 80% uh, non-US, for example. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful chance to meet people from a very wide uh, range of backgrounds. Um, the, this, the curriculum is pretty simple, uh, so I'll just explain it quickly. Um, you're in one of four majors. Uh, your core experience is taking a very intense year-long seminar in your major with anywhere from you know half a dozen to 15 people. You have one professor in the fall, one professor in the spring, a lot of uh, um, visitors from journalism and from elsewhere in the university. Uh, that class is is you know very demanding and sort of gives you the substance basics of the field you've chosen to study. There's another class that all MA students take in this room is a group called Evidence and Inference, which is an attempt to, uh, taught by me, uh, which is an attempt to teach journalists how to think more rigorously and deal more confidently with daunting subjects and with experts. Um, and then the, the heart of the experience in many ways is a very ambitious thesis project, 10,000 words. Um, that you start in the fall and finish in the spring. And over the years, you know, we've, we've been able to send people on reporting trips everywhere from Sri Lanka to Darfur to, you know, you name it, uh, uh, to do these incredible thesis projects, several of which have turned into books, documentary films, and so on. And then our graduates scatter all over and, and uh, are, um, for the most part, happily working really all, all over the country and all over the world. Um, so that's, that's the basics of what the MA program is. Um, we're small, so we hand sell. Uh, my email is my last name at columbia.edu. If you want to ask me a question, if you want to come in and talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, just email me and, and I'll set it up. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. And you can also find all of the faculty members on the website, if you go up here to the top bar and click on faculty, you'll find all of the faculty members and their contact information. What I'd like to do right now then is take some questions, any questions that you all in the audience have about the curriculum, either the MS or the MA curriculum. Um, hold off on your admissions questions, questions about the TOEFL, questions about financial aid, um, because we will talk with the, about that later in the session. So anybody with questions, I invite you to step up to the microphone um, and ask your questions. I guess somebody has to start, right? <laughs> uh, so obviously uh, clips are the things that kind of make and break a journalist's career. Uh, what kind of opportunities do students have to, to create clips that can be used uh, as part of a uh, resume? Yeah, we, we get that completely. Um, our business is, in an earlier phase of my life, I wrote a book about admissions. And um, this is, uh, what's, we do what's called authentic assessment, and journalism does authentic assessment. So the way we admit people, we do not require a standardized test except TOEFL for non-native English speakers. Um, and I know for me, the thing I look at the most is your clips coming in. Mm -hmm. And we're mindful, we are also kind of ungraded. And the reason we're kind of, we're mostly pass-fail. And the reason for that is, no employer, you know, we, we deal, as Elena mentioned, with hundreds of employers. Nobody ever says, I want to see your transcript of your grades in journalism school. They always say, I want to see your work. And so what we're trying to do in, in substantial part is have you come out of here with a fabulous and very powerful portfolio of actual journalistic work that you can you know, in, in some cases gets published, in some cases self-published, but that you can take out and show employers and that becomes the basis of, 
of uh, your, you know, that's your calling card into the job market. Yeah, it's, it's really fun at the career fair, which takes place right over here. Uh, a few years ago, the phenomenon started happening that my students were bringing their iPads and headphones and the, uh, uh, you know, across the table from an employer and playing the videos, listening to it there. So we are trying very much uh, to get your work up to a professional level. I think at the beginning, uh, you know, it's not my aim in the reporting class that I get you uh, published somewhere. That it really is my aim in that class to to help you learn how to be a reporter. In fact, one of my students did get picked up by uh, CNN.com because uh, she reported on a parish where the uh, the Pope was visiting this fall, and it turned out that the that the church itself had been closed down and there'd been a controversy and she wrote a, a fabulous little news piece about that and uh, you know CNN saw it on another website and the next thing you know she did have a clip but that comes a little that comes a little bit later and as I said in the documentary program and also in video we're really trying very hard to have you produce material that is up to professional standards and there's a great hunger out there for uh, content other questions? Yeah, I have a question about the um, MS program as compared to the MA. It just sounded like the MS program, there's not as much chance for like specialized subject matter reporting and like I have a pretty clear idea of like what I want to be reporting on. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit? The MA, MS program does have some subject matter courses. The MA has an overwhelming focus on subject matter. You have to ask yourself, what do I want in the mix for me more? Do I want, I mean, just because, you know, everybody has sticker shock over how much we cost, and it's kind of a joke, but kind of, but it's not a joke. This is the cheapest degree you can get in any field of endeavor in any Ivy League university, and that's because of the short time to degree. Um, and uh, so, you know, we could combine the two, but we're mindful that students want to be here for one year. Um, if you want, Overwhelming emphasis on subject matter expertise, MA program, if you want heavier but not total emphasis on the skills associated with gathering information and presenting it in a medium, MS program. Do you think that's? Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And if you look at our course offerings, I think you'll see that there are specializations, people who want to do reporting in sports or international reporting, investigative reporting. Business. Business report. Yes, there are business reporting. Mm -hmm. So there are. What, what's your topic of, that you're interested yeah. in? Just so. I'm interested in, in politics. I did my undergrad in political science, and so mm -hmm. I'm interested in like continuing that. So there are. There's also political reporting that. Um, yeah. National affairs. Here's another in the, test in, question. In EMS. If I say to you, mm -hmm. um, there was just uh, you know I just got a bulletin, and there's a five alarm fire in Brooklyn and it's quarter to 11 and I need you to go there, cover it and file at 6 p.m., a story that can run immediately. Can you do that now? Probably not. <laughs> uh, then you should do MS probably because the MA assumes that you already know how to do that. But if I say cover the Fed's interest rate deliberations, you say, uh, that, that's the next hurdle that we want to get you over. So, so you know, I, I do, the, the MA, MS delivers on the, you can go cover a breaking news story at a professional level. Uh, and and, and um, if you don't know how to do that, you might be struggling in the MS, in the MA program. The other thing that I would say is that we offer a wide variety of subject area courses that you can take in the MS program so that you would definitely be able to take a political reporting course, a national affairs reporting course, an international affairs reporting course. Um, there are also courses, you know, in, in feature writing, in profile writing, where you can focus some of the work that you do on political subjects um, so that you can kind of create that for yourself even within the MS program. Also, you know, we're a small school and, and with very individualized, so Christine and her colleagues actually run a sort of informal advice operation about this question in real time as they receive applications. So they often will contact you and say, 
you apply to the MA, but we think you you really should be in the MS or vice versa. So, so we we were very involved in that choice. Not it's not just like you send in the application and that's it. And I would say we're very involved in that because we want the students that we admit and who enroll here to have the very, very best experience possible. And so we look, we do look closely at experience, your goals, um, and where you want to end up as a journalist. Yes. <laughs> Um, my question kind of dovetails with hers, but so what would you say to someone who is currently employed as a professional journalist and is covering news and wants to get the more, you know, the more specialized experience but doesn't want to give up their job so only has time for part time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, the, the, uh, the MA at this time does, it does not have a um, a part-time uh, uh, offering, um, but as Betsy pointed out, you are able to specialize within the MS curriculum. Um, you know, it, whether it's in a subject area such as uh, business reporting, uh, politics, environmental reporting, um, and uh, or within um, a uh, particular methodology such as the use of data. Uh, investigative tools and so forth. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it sounds to me like the MS program, and because it's also designed in a way, especially in the part time program, we get a lot of working journalists who have put in a number of years but are missing that spe either that specialization or some of the digital skills that they need to sort of raise their game uh, a bit more. And so, what I find great is that that reporting class, that uh, core class, is uh, a wonderful thing in that professors know to meet students where they are. And my experience is that no matter how many years you have, it is really great to have a writing coach tear apart your writing and the things that you've been doing, the bad habits you've been practicing for the last 10 years, and, and clean it up and push you to be you know, a better reporter and, and thus a better writer. Yeah, I mean, I've had experience uh, with working reporters uh, in my my class because they want to learn video they they or they want to learn digital so they're coming here um, to to raise their game to get new skills and they bring a lot to us we're happy to see oh, yeah. someone who uh, has been working as a reporter understands how to do it and 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 to work with them sorry uh, could you join the uh, student newspaper as a student uh, I mean, uh, there are certain schools on. Yeah. It seems that no, uh, that's the uh, that's the one thing we can do anything in the world for you except that the, the Columbia Spectator is a separate 501c3 down the street, completely staffed by Columbia undergraduates. Now, I suppose you could walk in and say, "I want to write for you," and there's nothing there. They have nothing to do with us, so mm. we can't stop you from doing that. We keep you really busy during the year, but we have no official relationship with them. So do students publish any kind of, you know, a, a live paper of any sort? Like, is there a live Not paper? here, but a lot of students publish, you know, out in the so-called real world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that, that happens, we, we don't have an internal student newspaper, uh, uh, partly because we're sort of aiming higher. Um, so in the course of a year, X percent mm -hmm. of X number of pieces by current students will be published, and then in the next six months, another chunk yeah. of you know master's thesis, master's projects in 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 adopted form will be published. In my cohort of master's thesis advisees last year, um, two have been published. Um, oh. Also, but we do we have do a lot of websites, uh, yeah. stu student-run websites that are actually, you know, bu building up quite a readership, such as the BrooklynInc.com, yeah. uh, SchoolStories.org, uh, covering religion. Um, a number of classes have uh, dedicated websites that, uh, as I said, have been around for a bit and have uh, developed uh, readership, but also provide uh, a digital clip for 
uh, for you to link to when you do create your portfolio, which is becoming something of an industry standard. Um, but it's, uh, uh, you know, um, not the sort of thing that lives forever, you know. I'm always telling students, don't always expect that link to work, that you should always have some format in which you collect your own work. Mm -hmm. And uh, to recruiters, it's sometimes at your level, doesn't necessarily matter a huge amount that you don't have, you know, five clips in the New York Times or Newsday or uh, the, the Huffington Post. It's the quality of work, really, that is mm -hmm. essential. They know what they're getting, recruiters, when they come to us. Um, and so they really just want to read a really well done story, whether it's something you did uh, in the classroom or something that you published outside. And we do encourage you to, to make your own portfolio and help you with some, some classes to uh, sometimes some after, uh, after hours events to help you put together a portfolio because I think people do uh, respond to that, employers respond to that. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like to get an idea of some of the work that our students have produced that has been published, there is also a link on the website right up there by the faculty link um, that is to student work. And you can see some of these wonderful articles that have been published in the New York or the Atlantic, in Salon, in uh, many, many, in the New York Times, in many different places. Hi, good morning. Um, I just had a question about the MS program. Is there some sort of differentiation um, in the curriculum between students who want to primarily focus on television and students who primarily want to focus on print? I mean, I know there was mentioned that the master's project, you could do a print piece, video, a combination of both, but I was wondering if there was somewhere else in the curriculum that separates the two. Well, I think starting in the second half of the first semester, uh, when you can opt for a video class, uh, everyone has to take a writing class, but you can take writing for broadcast. You can opt for a video class, and then in the spring, you can take your uh, uh, at least one video workshop. You can take uh, video storytelling, nightly news. Uh, we have a series. I think we're probably four. City newsroom. City newsroom. Uh, we have about uh, three or four options for the mm -hmm. for people who are thinking and looking at uh, broadcast. I think we also do some on-air skills workshops. Uh, so. Again, when we revamped the curriculum, we were, were trying to make it flexible for people. So in a way, rather than declaring a concentration and us telling you, okay, now you're going to take this course and this course and this course, mm -hmm. we're giving you some flexibility to design your, your own specialty. We, we did this mindful that every newspaper now has a crew of videographers. Every t TV station has a crew of writers who produce their website. So the lines have blurred. Uh, so, as Betsy said, we, we have blurred our own very strict lines between, you know, delivery systems and, and it, you sort of build your own de facto concentration. But you will find as a, uh, as a television journalist, suddenly they'll say, write that story for, uh, for right. the website. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a, kind of a print skill. Right. Right. And I think in my day, when I was coming yeah, up in didn't. network news, we were writing television scripts. But I wasn't writing news stories that were going uh, on the yeah, web page. We now my students do. Uh, yeah. If you worked in a union shop, you weren't allowed to touch, touch. a camera yeah. of any kind. So. Wow. Yeah, it's very different. I think one of the things that we also knew about our graduates is that it was not surprising for a person who had specialized in print to end up in broadcast or for a magazine person to end up in digital. And so I think what we're trying to do in the MS program is to ensure that you have the skills to go in many different directions. Okay. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just kind of follow up to her question. I wanted to address the Master of Science program and particularly the seminar courses. Uh, I know that there are different seminars that are offered that are, and they change every year depending on the class. But for someone who, like myself, I'm interested in sports journalism and potentially radio, can you just speak a, a, to a little more about that and what might be offered and what? Like, and you also mentioned that you kind of create your own uh, path with those seminars. So can you address that a little bit more? Well, um, from the radio point of view, we have a fantastic uh, radio workshop, which really has been uh, modeled on the lines of uh, NPR uh, and has turned out an awful lot of uh, NPR uh, reporters right now. If you hear Elsa Chang, she's a graduate, or, or, or many others when I'm, I'm listening on the radio go, oh, <laughs> there she is. Uh, so yes, we have, we have that 
that option for radio. And we also have had a uh, writing for sports, is that yes, right? Yes, we have yeah, a sports. We have a perennial. Sports, a perennial, so people, yes. people do that the, as well. You basically prepare for it by, excuse me, I'm sorry, you prepare for it by taking the radio, uh, the audio image and sound. You'll get a little taste of audio when you do the boot camp in August, um, but then you make the choice to take that audio class uh, image and sound module in the fall as a prerequisite to do the radio seminar in the spring. So it, you know, it sort of works out um, perfectly that way. Um, so you're prepared for that, and the seminar is 15 weeks. Um, you know, it will be taught by Daniel Alarcón, uh, who is uh, an incredible uh, radio journalist, the creator of Radio Ambulante, um, and uh, Carrie Donahue, who is an incredible radio journalist um, and one of our most dedicated professors. She's always there to help all of our students, whether they take a deep dive into, uh, into audio, into radio, uh, or whether it's something that they want to have as part of their portfolio, but not necessarily the main body of work. Thank you. Hey there. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the way that the investigative journalism um, separates from or adds to the basic curriculum. So you apply to something called the Stabile program, um, which is, uh, it has, I would say, two salient features. One is investigative and two is special scholarship money attached. And it's kind of a one-two punch, so it gets a lot of applicants. Um, and then uh, you're in a special, stable, oriented reporting section. There's, there's, you know, everybody takes reporting. The whole class of MS is divided into groups of 15 or so. Um, so I, I'm a co-teacher of, of, of the stable reporting class with, with another uh, colleague. Um, so you do, you, you get sort of special handling through the year. Hovering over everything is Sheila Carnell, who you met briefly, and, and you take a, uh, you, you have some touch points with her in the fall and a lot of contact in the spring. Um, so it, it, you know, people who aren't in the Stabile program should leave here as capable investigative reporters, mm -hmm. but the Stabile program itself is a very special experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a few. I think this year, I think we have three Stabiles who are also doing documentaries. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you can that's also that's combine true. Stabile and documentary. In fact, the the uh, project that I mentioned that the Times is picking up is was a uh, Stabile uh, video project. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, how could the uh, full time MS program help one develop? say, web-based, long-form content development skills, less traditional stuff. Yeah, well, that's what we're here to do. So, what, you know, very roughly speaking, the fall semester is more of a sort of core curriculum that everybody does, and the spring is more a, an elective curriculum that you assemble. I'm oversimplifying, but that's kind of the <coughs> basics. And we do have a lot, you know, if you're interested in long-form web-based journalism, we do have a whole bunch of resources that we've added in recent years mm -hmm. to get you there. Um, and you can execute your master's project as a long-form web project also. Um, so it won't be every second of the year because there's this sort of core concept that we want everybody to learn certain things. Um, but, but you can build your you know, go through the cafeteria and build a, a set of special skills there. Um, hi, um, good morning. Um, I was wondering if within the MS program there's opportunities to maybe um, explore, like, say, international reporting? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There are offerings in uh, international reporting. I mean, we have a, a kind of, uh, we have a lot of professors who are, uh, have, a, have expertise in international reporting. And Ann Cooper is heading up a, an initiative 
to uh, enhance our offerings. I mean, there are always uh, speakers coming here and events going on at the school that are involving journalists from around the world and issues involving uh, uh, international reporting as well as courses and teaches uh, international reporting in the spring. And I think this there are two, China, um, a, China, a China seminar. Um, we had an Africa seminar, I think. We've had, you Conflict know, a number reporting. of a number of, uh, of opportunities. Because we do have such a, a global student body, they're also a resource to us. So. I was when also going to say, if you take a look at the events section of the website, um, it'll give you an idea of the kinds of international reporting that we're introducing students to. So there's, um, on November 9th, a Meet the Media event for our, just for our students with Agence France Presse. Um, there is um, a covering religion course that we offer um, that Ari Goldman teaches that always has an international focus and Italy. goes over and does a, and does right. a trip and does every a trip every spring in uh, in March for one week they go to a region to cover the religion in that region so they may go to India or to uh, Israel. Israel this year they're going to Italy Italy. And then, um, for example, in the uh, in in a week or two, there's going to be an all class conversation with Catherine Boo, the um, author of of Behind the Beautiful Forevers. There are also FOIA workshops. There's going to be a conversation with the New York Times foreign correspondent Elisa Rubin, and w also with Jill Abramson. Um, there are going to be really just all kinds of, of guest speakers who are here, and that's the guest speakers. That is not even the classes, so you really get many, many opportunities for learning more about that type of reporting. Thank you. Any last questions? Okay. I'm going to thank our panelists, Nick, Betsy, Elena. Um, very much, and we'll just take a minute to switch panelists. Our students, uh, our current students will join us, um, and I know you've been waiting for that too. So if you'd like to grab a bite, now's the time to do it. John. Sorry. 
For those of you on the live stream, we're just taking a couple minutes to get some coffee, some baked goods. I'm sorry we can't offer that to you um, in person. Right? While we're waiting, I'm just going to run a clip of last year's career services event so you can get an idea. One of the idea. reasons why I decided to come to journalism school is because I really believe that journalism is the way we understand and conceive of the world. And you need to know how to tell somebody's story in a compelling manner. Before I came to Columbia Journalism School, um, I had no previous experience in journalism. I knew in order to be able to tell stories, I have to be able to understand the fundamentals of asking the right questions. I really thought a lot before coming back to J School because, um, you know, I was out there, I was an experienced reporter with a staff position. But the idea to take this step back and look at your own craft through this new lens, I'm really sure that um, I'm going to, you know, emerge as a better journalist. Colombia has a 100-year-old history of journalism excellence. We are where the Pulitzer Prizes are given out. This is Joseph Pulitzer School. Students at the school learn how to be great journalists, and that starts with great reporting. We give every student the confidence to investigate, to be fast and accurate on a story, and we teach how to think about journalism. Where are the stories that matter? Read up about your story before you pitch it. It's got to be smart, sharp, fast, and knowing. Starting out at Columbia Journalism School is a pretty intense experience because so much is required of you in so little time. But that's also a bit of the beauty. To be able to pack in what most graduate schools do in a couple years in 12 months was very beneficial for me. The MS program is meant to be like a journalism boot camp. It introduces you to the basic skills of journalism, whether they're digital skills, data skills, video skills, audio skills, but with a firm foundation in reporting, in getting information, verifying information, and telling the story. We start reporting class the very first week of school. Within a couple days, we were outside of the classroom and out and reporting. Hey, Vian. <laughs> Great to see you. It was very interesting, kind of nerve-wracking, but very cool. I definitely see value in that experience because now I feel like I can find a story under a rock if I have to. When you're out in the field reporting, you're in constant communication with your professor who's your editor. It's great to have that autonomy, but also know that it's okay to make mistakes. And I think the faculty is very keen in trying to ensure that you kind of get out there and explore and develop your own craft. At the heart of the school is the seminar. The faculty are around a small table with the students in virtually every important class. Our classes at the journalism school are very small and students work closely with their professors who are outstanding journalists in their own respective fields. You don't get this kind of mentoring in the newsroom. Okay, I'm gonna stop it right there because I think everybody has found their seats now. Um, but now I'm going to invite our students, um, our current students, to talk a little bit about their own experiences. Um, and as we did with the faculty, please hold your questions until after each student has had an opportunity to speak. Um, but I know that they are going to be very happy to answer any questions that you've got. Um, John, would you like to start? Um, and just if each of you could talk a little bit about um, who you are, where you've come from, um, 
what made you think about Columbia Journalism School and what you're doing here right now as a student and where you'd like to see yourself when you graduate? Hi, uh, my name's John. I am from Connecticut. Um, I've done a lot of things. I'm in the part-time program and I right now I write for a legal news website called Law360 um, where I cover a bunch of different things like uh, energy, banking, healthcare, life sciences, and project finance. And it's a lot of it's a lot of work to do that and school at the same time, but it is doable. And I've really enjoyed my time here doing that. Um, and coming from, I worked at a local newspaper in Connecticut for two years before I came here. And coming from there right into the reporting class at the beginning, there was a lot of stuff that I already knew how to do, but my professors challenged me with that. They were like, well, what don't you know how to do? And so everything became like, it got to the point where at the end I was like getting a 50-page like a study and being like, well, let's see if I can do this in an hour. And <laughs> it, it was fun because they, they challenged me and to, to like really get to the, the deadline sort of things. And I came here because I value education and I always want to better myself and better what I do and the more I can learn the better and uh, I think that's also why I'm a journalist because I get to learn a new thing every day and it's it's been great being here so far because I've learned a lot of new things that I never would have gotten to learn in the field even even though I've been there for three years now and I've done a lot of different things um, I think that should cover it okay. for now. Thank you, John. Ko. Okay, hi. I'm Ko. My first name's just K-O. Ko, that's it. Um, I j came to the program right after I graduated from Spelman in May. Um, and there I was the editor-in-chief of the student newspaper, which had previously been out of print. And um, a couple of my classmates and I like rebuilt it. And so that's been my primary journalism experience prior to the school. Um, Columbia was the only place I applied. I literally put all my eggs in one basket. I didn't look at any other journalism schools. Um, I figured there are journalists who don't get their master's, so if I'm gonna go get my master's, I'm gonna get my master's in the best place, um, period. So I didn't apply to jobs, I only applied to Columbia, and when I got it in March, I was really, really relieved because um, I had no backup plan. Um, and now, uh, in the reporting class, we picked the beat. I've been covering Little Senegal in Harlem and sort of the West African community. Um, sort of, it's like where I live and I really love to get to know my neighbors in like a different kind of way. Um, I, well, I've always known that I wanted to go to Columbia for journalism school, but I think that every day my choice is reaffirmed as being the best one um, because it's, it's really a safe space. Um, I really, I have friends who didn't go to journalism school who work in the field and it's really stressful to be in an environment where it's high pressure, you're breaking news, et cetera, et cetera. And if you make a mistake, you, you, could, be, you could be done. Um, here it's a learning environment. So, you know, I make a mistake, my professor could be upset, but she may understand that I, I don't have like, you know, real world experience. And it's comfortable to be able to be in an environment where I had a professor say, I want all of you to fail spectacularly instead of just, you know, getting by and sort of doing a piece that's like okay and safe because you can do those kinds of things here. So I'm um, really excited to be here and like answer your questions and things like that. Thank you. Hassan. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Hassan Santour. I am originally from Somalia but uh, grew up in Canada. Uh, I worked as a freelance journalist uh, for about seven years, um, mostly in uh, public radio and uh, sort of felt like I was hitting a, a, a sort of an invisible ceiling that I couldn't really quite describe. It just felt like I needed to take my career in journalism to the next level and um, I decided to go and get a master's degree in journalism and when I made that decision it was pretty much either Columbia or nothing. I was just gonna and like Cove said <laughs> I didn't have a backup plan which probably isn't a good idea um, but I basically it was either Columbia or, or just go into the world and, and continue being a freelance journalist. And uh, um, sorry, am I missing anything else? Maybe because you're an MA student. Oh, yeah. yes, sorry, uh, and I am. And what the, made you choose the MA versus the MS? Yes, 
So I am in the MA um, uh, stream and specifically in politics. Uh, I spent, uh, like I said, about seven years covering um, mostly politics, human interest stories, current affairs, and uh, I wanted to, to get a more sort of in-depth knowledge of of world politics because I'm a political junkie in general anyway. So um, that's, that's, and th I, I felt like I didn't really, I, you, as somebody was saying earlier, when you're applying, you have the option of, of both being considered for the MS and the MA, and I actually said I didn't want to be considered for the MS because I felt like I, all those skills that you would learn in the MS program, which is how to cover a story, I felt like I had those. And I, I wanted to deepen those skills and, and, and really become sort of the best journalist that I could become. Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna turn this over to my audience here. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect that you've got lots and lots and lots of questions. Don't make a liar out of me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for starting. Mm -hmm. It always takes one person to start. And <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I was wondering if you guys can talk about what uh, your classwork, your class load is like right now, what kind of projects you're pursuing, and how you're pulling from all your different classes to create your work. And if you have to create, like, uh, what the delivery requirements are. Like, do you have, like, five classes, five different big assignments, stuff like that, or can you, f do one project in one class that satisfies others, stuff like that? Uh, I can start with that. Um, so I am in the, like I said, in the MA politics uh, program. I am taking, there are some compulsory courses that you have to take like evidence and inference and your, um, your sort of concentration seminar, which is politics, which is six hours a week, um, a lot of reading. Um, but then you also have to take three outside courses. So this semester I'm taking a course at the Institute for uh, um, Human Rights Studies. Um, I, I think I'm getting that name wrong. Uh, but basically it, it's, because uh, that's one of the areas that I'm interested in is, is human rights and uh, international affairs. So um, that's uh, what I'm doing. And you can, you can sort of use the things you learned in one class and sort of apply it to, to deepen your, um, your work in another class, but I find that in order to, to really get sort of as much variety of, of, of learning uh, experiences, I find it's really good to actually diversify your courses and, and really get as much out of these nine months as possible. Um, so I'll give you sort of like a sample week. Um, right now, I guess we sort of, I think the classes work in like seven week modules. So in the beginning, well, August is like boot camp. So you learn audio and you learn photo and that's like all you're doing and then you start reporting. Reporting is a seven week crash course in how to do a story, picking a beat, getting comfortable doing research and all of those things. And I'm in the documentary program. So I spent those seven weeks with one of the documentary professors, June Cross. Um, and so that's basically get, you get your feet wet and on Fridays you take um, one of the journalism essential well, two. Um, they're called a four pack and the first seven weeks you take two, the next seven weeks you take the other two, law, history, ethics, and business. Um, so your Fridays are consumed by that and then two days out of the week you'll either be, um, you know, when you're doing reporting that's all you're doing and then now we switch modules and I'm taking an audio class um, and I'm taking video. So Mondays, I, well Tuesdays I come to the school for video, Thursdays I come to the school for audio, Fridays I'm here all day for the for, for like one of the essentials classes and then you have like advisory meetings um, for the documentary program on Fridays as well. So there's two days out of the week that I have um, Mondays and Wednesdays to sort of do reporting. Um, they're not really days off, like there's nobody who's making you come to class but it's on your own time to get your stories done because you have two classes that are requiring you to produce things. So um, audio and video take a lot of editing. So I'm going to be here um, and it's nice to have those days built in um, so I know that you know if I'm reporting on Monday I can come in on Wednesday and do all the editing and the buildings open all the time so a lot of late night working um, and things like that. But um, it's nice to have those days built in but they're definitely not like free relaxed days. 
So I'm in the part-time program. As I said, it's a little bit different for me. Um, the balancing work and school and regular life um, was a challenge at first, but then I figured it out, and now I am able to go to work, go to my classes. Um, I play three intramural sports in the city because I have time to do that still. Um, it just is a matter of scheduling. And for the classes that I've taken so far, the boot camp, uh, we did in the summer. And I've been here since the summer. And so for photo and audio, um, I had a little bit of background in photo in that my previous job would pay me an extra $10 if we got a photo for our story. And <laughs> $10 is what some of us wanted sometimes. Um, but, and, but I didn't really know how to do it. And like, they liked it because I was one of the few reporters who would take a non-blurry photo. And <laughs> so, but once I got into the photo class, I was able to like learn what constitutes a good photo. And um, I can now, I feel more comfortable volunteering my services to take photos for, for things at my current job. Um, and, for reporting, it was it was a crash course, and there was we covered most of the time. It covers, uh, I believe, like neighborhoods, but my class covered parks. Um, so I had to I had to basically beat report on Riverbank State Park <laughs> up there, um, and that was definitely interesting because I've covered local governments, but I've never just covered a park, and that was it was kind of challenging at times to find a story in that park, but it was doable, and it, when I did find them, it was great, um, because I felt very accomplished that I had found a story where I was like, are there gonna be stories in this park? Um, and then I went and I took a family, writing family history class, and that was more, it was just working towards one 3,000 word story about your family history, and that was, it involved interviewing your family members, researching historical documents, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but so far, none of my classes have really overlapped. Um, maybe it's because I'm in the part-time program. Maybe that will happen. I've only been here since June. Um, and now I'm taking data, because data is something that I've never dealt with, other than um, knowing, that I, knowing how to make percentages. Um, and being able to recognize when uh, other people weren't doing them right, and that's about it. So I hope that answers that question. Just really quick to touch on the overlapping piece. Um, I would never turn in a piece of work in one class and turn it in again, but I will say that your sources will overlap. So for example, relationships that I developed in reporting are definitely proving to be fruitful now that I'm in other classes. You know, They can always help you, so I think those things overlap. Your interests will overlap and things like that, but um, actual like physical assignments probably won't. In fact, you can't turn in yeah. the same assignment. You can't, <laughs> <laughs> it's big trouble. Yeah, Self-plagiarism, I think that's what yeah. they are. <laughs> yeah. Hi, good morning. Uh, my question was actually for John, but you kind of touched based on it a little bit. Um, basically asking um, someone who works full time or, and also in school part time, how do you like kind of manage both of them, um, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but also I wanted to ask you, like, what is a typical day for you? Like, how many courses are you taking um, to be a part-time student and things like that? And maybe how many hours a week are you working? Um, and what is, like, the balance in there somewhere? So the summer was the busiest time because I had um, the reporting, the photo, and the audio all overlapped a little bit. Um, I took my reporting class on Saturday because it was then I wouldn't have to take any work off to do it. Um, and that, it was, it was good because I could get it all done on that day and I could often go out and report in the park and I could also go and report in the park on, the, uh, on Sunday. And right now, it, I've, it's only been one class per week, so it's always been on Thursdays for me. So my typical day on a Thursday when I have class is to go to work um, from from like 9 to 5, because um, my class is at 6, and then go to class, and then be at the class. And then the work you can get done throughout the week. Um, it hasn't been a challenge so far. Um, for interviewing my family was 
pretty easy because I know where all of them are. Um, <laughs> and I can, <laughs> I can find them easily. Um, for the data class, that's just started. Um, so I'm not really sure exactly how that's going to go. But I imagine it will be the same. I'll be able to spread my work out across the week because there's only one class per week. OK. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good morning. I just wanted to ask you guys uh, if you guys could speak a little more about the, the boot camp, the first seven weeks, because I'm sure a lot of us in here already have skills, you know, uh, writing, editing, shooting. Uh, I just wanted to know how in that seven week program they uh, initially break your work down and then reconstruct it. Um, so I forget how long like the audio and photo boot camps are. I think they're just only maybe a few weeks um, and then reporting is seven weeks. but. There are people in my class who had been professional photojournalists or had worked in radio, but um, the Columbia does a really good job at bringing in people who will kind of break you down no matter what level you're at um, and then work on building you back up in the little bit of time you had left. Um, so I think that no matter what place you're at, you, the whole experience of that of this school is humbling because you came here to say I'm a student and I have places where I can grow so I think that if you come in and you have that attitude throughout then you're gonna know that someone who's coming in to teach photo is gonna find something that you can learn from um, so I thought I was a great writer I thought you know I'll be able to do this great like I've taken photos when I travel like my Instagram is beautiful um, <laughs> and then you get here and there's all these things that you probably actually don't know and and that someone will be able to identify and say, this is good, but you want better. So um, no matter what level you are at. Um, and they'll critique other people's published works, like their colleagues. They'll pull them up and say, hey, like, I like what they did, but what do you think they could do better? Um, and I think that that kind of environment of getting professional advice, but also you know, your, your colleagues to say, I like what you did, but you know, do this better, um, that happens in photo and audio and your writing. In all my classes, they take your writing and they put it right up on the screen and they literally line by line and it's kind of embarrassing at first, but then you kind of embrace it because at the end of the day, like I will keep reiterating, this is a safe space and I would rather have um, learned this now with my people who I call my friends now than um, to learn it later and it be sort of like a harder lesson. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I can't really speak to the, the boot camp thing because I haven't been through that, but I do want to reiterate what Coach said about, you know, it's one thing to, because I've been working as a journalist for seven years, and then you come to a class that is being taught by Alexandra Stelly, who is, you know, <clears throat> an incredible journalist and has been writing for The New Yorker for God knows how many years now. And for somebody of that caliber to go through your your writing and to show you all the bad habits you've sort of picked up all, all, you know, along the years, that's an invaluable experience. You can't really get that anywhere else. Yeah. Um, th she covered a lot of, most of the boot camp stuff. Um, but the one thing that stuck out to me was for the photo boot camp, um, photojournalists obviously have to take pictures of people. And a lot of people when they come in are more comfortable just taking pictures of things because you don't really have to take a picture of a person doing a thing and have them wonder what you're doing. Um, so we had to go out into parks in the city and take pictures of people without telling them what we were doing. And that was a challenge because and after the first assignment, all the photos that I took were like really far away and like <laughs> of people like not looking at me. Um, I, you learn some sort of strategies, like I learned that I, if I stood at like an intersection, I could see someone interesting walking toward me and I pretend to take pictures of things behind them. And then as I got closer, I would just take pictures of them and then keep taking pictures after they passed by. And I had a lot of pictures of people looking at me like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> um, I didn't have anyone get mad at me. There was some guy who, who said, uh, it's a pretty intense lens you got there, bro. Um, but that was about it. Uh, but <laughs> it, the, the boot camp um, definitely teaches you a lot of stuff that even if you have experience, like the, you, could, you can always learn more. Um, and since it's f photo and audio, like for audio, we had to go out and report and put together a, I believe it was a three minute audio story. And three minutes is a lot longer than you think it is when you're doing a, an audio story. And um, like she said, there was a lot, like there was a professional freelance photojournalist in our class 
and she was very helpful when it came to telling you, like, like helping you out with how to do photos right. So. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, I wanted to know, like, how important is it to be updated on local, national, international news, um, especially if you're going for the MS program? Is that a Maybe trick start. question to get me to talk about the writing test? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just like while you're in the program, um, like, is it really important to, I mean, I know you're busy in the program, is it really important to be keep updated on all those stuff too? I think what you'll find is that at Columbia Journalism School, we do nothing but journalism. We, assess, we obsess about it 24 hours a day, um, whether it's local, whether it's state, whether it's national, whether it's international. Um, that's my perspective, but I think you guys talk about your experiences. Yeah, I could speak to that in that um, if you go to, there's a building across the, the Learner building where they have a lot of copies of the New York Times. The glass-fronted building. Yeah, and so every day before I even come to my class, I just grab a copy and I, sometimes I may not have a lot of time to read it or to go through the whole thing, but it's really Im important that you get a sense of what's happening in the world because inevitably in class, some big story in the news, whether it's in politics or environmental coverage, whatever it is that you're doing, it's gonna come up and it's really important that you know <laughs> what's happening in the world. So uh, that's uh, it, uh, something that I find that even though I am so busy reading, uh, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of books and articles, it's still this is, after all, the Pulitzer Journalism School. You can't you can't really get by without knowing what's happening in the world. Um, for me, I I know a lot about what's going on in the world just because I'm I have to cover things on a regular basis. Um, most of my focus is on things that happen in my beats at my job, um, but I still, like, when I'm on the subway, I'll read a lot of things because it's a half hour ride and otherwise I just sit there. Um, so, but for my classes so far um, with the parks, it was, it was good to know, like, if things went on in parks. Like, a lot of people followed, like, park social media, stuff like that. Um, it, so far it's been for me as a part-timer like specific to what I'm covering at that time but also with my job I know what's going on in uh, like I have to one of the things I'm covering for my job is a giant dispute um, between Ecuador and Chevron over rainforest pollution from like the 80s and that is just this massive sprawling civil case in like a bunch of different countries and like I need to know what's going on with that and I need to know what's going on in like the banking sector and stuff. So there is a lot of reading, but for me it's specific to like what I'm covering at the time. Um, and then I would also say um, that you kind of owe it to the people whose stories you're telling to know what's going on in their world and the world in general. So we, got, we had an assignment in reporting when uh, the United Nations General Assembly was happening. Woke up, checked my phone, and I had a text from my professor that we needed to be downtown by 9 a.m. and it was 7 and luckily I had checked my phone because usually I don't. I just come to school and I live across the park so I usually cut it kind of close. Um, but I ended up doing a story on how, you know, on like the Iranian protest and how there were a lot of other groups that had been there. Like there were, um, there was um, like a drum line from Baltimore that had been there. Just like people who you really wouldn't expect to be in an Iranian protest. But if I didn't know, hadn't been, looked in the news and like understood what was going on, then I don't think I would have done as good of a story. And so I think that in order to be able to tell the stories of people that we meet, like you have to know what's going on in the world. Thank you. Hi, um, my question is specifically for Ko. I'm in a similar position um, as an undergraduate student journalist. So I was wondering if you could speak to coming into the MS program with you know, student journalist experience. Yeah, um, so I really didn't have a lot of like solid, you know, journalism experience. Like um, Spellman's newspaper had been out of print. We didn't have a, like an advisor who had ever worked in journalism. So it was basically us just trying to figure it out. Um, so 
I think that coming here, um, I knew that I needed to go to journalism school. Spelman didn't have a journalism program. So I knew that if I wanted to be a journalist, like I really, I needed to go to school for it. Um, and like you had said, like I believe in education. So I think that having a master's like sets you apart. Um, but coming in, I, I guess like, is your question just more like, what's the transition like or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I was really excited. Um, I think that, you know, it's easy to sort of be like intimidated because there's people here that have worked. Um, you know, one of my really good friends in the program worked at CNN in Turkey and he had been covering like conflict zones and I haven't done anything like that. I don't know how to work a camera. I don't know how to do any of those things, but it doesn't mean that I don't deserve to be here and it doesn't mean that I can't do good work here. So I think that just knowing like what makes your experience valid and like why you want to move forward and why you want to be a journalist is important in the process. Um, being a student journalist, like, that's still cool. There's some people who come here who have no journalism experience, who've never written for a publication. So, like, that's cool. And I think the transition has been good. Like, um, it, I haven't really had any rough patches yet. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so I was wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about like your vision for your like ultimate career goals, where you see, see yourself going, and also if that's changed at all since you started the program. Um, well, I jokingly say I, I, I want to cover Africa for the um, you know, New Yorker, but that's uh, where would I like to see? I, I just want to really, to be honest with you, I just want to be the best journalist that I can be and go out there into the world and, and cover uh, stories that I'm interested in, both in radio and in print. That's uh, my ambition. What exactly form that takes, I have no idea, and I, I'm kind of not really interested in knowing. It's like I like to just sort of see what happens in the world. Um, and sorry, what was the second question you said? If, has, if so that has I was wondering if you know, your vision or your plans have changed at all, or mm -hmm. if by being at the program, it's given you new insight? Yeah, I was talking to somebody the other day uh, who teaches um, sort of journalism entrepreneurship. I don't, know, I don't know exactly what it's called, but like, uh, and I started thinking about, because nowadays with, with blogs and with podcasts, and I have a background in, in radio, I, I'm seriously thinking about like if I have the capacity and I definitely have the interest but if I have the capacity to create something of my own that is sort of entrepreneurial I'm not sure exactly what form that's going to take but I'm really interested in exploring that uh, so I've always done a lot of things at once um, before I came here I have I've been a construction worker with my dad, um, I've been a fencing coach, I've been a reporter, all, sometimes all at the same time. Um, so I have a lot of things that I want to do. Um, I, the overarching goal is to have people trust what I write and know that when they're reading what I'm writing, it's accurate and that's what's happening. Um, aside from that, like I wanna tell people's stories. Um, everyone has a story, you just have to figure out where to find it. Um, I learned that specifically when writing about my family history um, because I wrote about my mom's father who I never met uh, because he died in 1980 um, and he had this life of <laughs> unfortunate bad luck I might say. Um, he was born in a coal mining town. He was stationed as a military police officer in uh, Tokyo after the bombs were dropped on Japan, um, and he may have been stationed in Hiroshima after that. Um, and then he went to work in Love Canal, um, which was a terrible uh, environmental disaster, and like all sorts of this stuff, and then he eventually got cancer and mm -hmm. died. Um, and I never met him, and just to, to tell his story was really fun, and I want to tell other people's stories. And then, I mean, <laughs> there have been things that I've wanted to do that have kind of been like, pushed off to the side that I'm just like, oh, maybe I don't want to do that. Like, um, but I would still like to, I don't know, maybe eventually one day either be a professor to teach, to teach people how to do what we do, um, or to run my own, maybe not my own, but like be the head of a news organization to like get my ideas going throughout that. Um, 
it's a lot of things. It's like a bunch of scattered things, I know, but like, that's what I'm like. <laughs> um, I think that my, like what I want to do has, has changed or actually just like new things have fallen on my plate. Um, right now I'm applying, Columbia has a dual degree program with Sciences Po, it's um, a university in Paris. And you can go there for a year and get another master's in journalism and also intern. Um, and I know that I like really, I, I lived in Paris before um, and I like reporting in Little Senegal as I had mentioned because it's a French speaking community. Um, but I think that getting some international experience would, is something that I hadn't really considered. Like I love traveling, but I never thought about working abroad. Um, and that's something that's sort of changed since I've been here. Um, and as you said before, AFP is coming, another French news organization. Um, and so now it's like every, you know, there's all these opportunities that are here that may not have been, you know, just so easy and accessible um, had I not, you know, been to, at the school. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very, very much. Um, I don't know if you're able to stay a little bit longer. Um, we'll be probably another 20, 25 minutes, um, maybe even a half an hour. Um, but in any case, in case people might have questions. So thank you. Thank you. And next, I'd like to introduce Gina Bubian. Um, Gina, do you want to use the podium or do you want to sit? Um, I can use the podium because I want to show you. want to use up. this. Okay. This is Gina Bubian, the Assistant Director of the Career Services Center, also a longtime professional journalist herself. Good morning. I'm going to show you a two and a half minute video which might seem long after what I, what I just heard, but it's of our expo, our career expo, which is the biggest in the country. And it's a lot of fun, so let me just go to that. I knew it was going to be a big event, but I think once the doors open and you get past uh, the name tags, it's it a lot bigger of a production than I thought it would be. to meet people, to connect and network. The career fair, it's really crazy. Feels like speed dating. I think it's also a great warm introduction to the employers. Tell me a little bit about some of your strongest skill sets. So, so far, I've been doing print and digital, but I also really love creating videos for web. Many of them asked about data and social media. They are also asking about how you find the stories. When you talk about your clips or something, they really want to know, so how did you find it? Which sources did you talk to? The good thing about our school is that we really get all aspects of it. Really, the people that we're looking for can do anything. We're coming up with the ideas. We're doing the pre-reporting. We're like finding the sources. We're shooting. We're editing. We've traveled a long way to get here, but it's been worth it because we found at least three or four people I think I would be willing to hire. Yes, fans here every year just because the candidates are so impressive. Like I said, I feel like everyone that I sit down with, I'm blown away. What a great fit a lot of Columbia people have been at ESPN is what keeps us coming back. Well, I've been going strong since 9 o'clock this morning. I had about eight or nine interviews. I interviewed at places like Bloomberg TV, Yahoo News, CNN Money. Everyone here was just so welcoming and friendly and wanting to talk to us and find out more about us as students and what our skill sets are so they can figure out a good match. I've done about 12 or 13 interviews. I'm exhausted, but I couldn't be happier about the doors that I opened today. Pleasure meeting Thank you. you so I'll be much. in touch. Okay. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> All right, great to meet you. Thank you very much. Well, I really you. appreciate it. You know, now, in hindsight, it's, it was all worth it, you know, all the preparation. This is all what we've come to the J School for, to finally have this moment. It's a great experience. I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes after today. Okay, 
Uh, to the student who asked about having to be up on the news, just so you know, employers ask you. <laughs> oh, sorry, okay. Employers will ask you in interviews, what would you lead the newscast with? Give me five story ideas. So you really do have to immerse yourself. If you're not a news junkie, then, um, then you know, there are other schools, you know, that are more focused on writing as opposed to re reporting. Um, so I'm, I'm the, the Associate Director of Career Services, and I am part of a small but tenacious team at Columbia that you would be working closely with if, if uh, should you attend Columbia. I came to Columbia nine years ago. I was a reporter in, at newspapers. I worked in Philadelphia, in St. Paul, in San Jose, and I covered crime, courts, juvenile justice, poverty, social issues, and uh, always, no matter what, what I had on my plate, I was uh, always covering breaking news. and. Uh, and I lo always loved being on deadline, which I didn't know about myself when I was an undergrad. It was only until I was in a newsroom that I realized how what, what an adrenaline rush. And the students here talk about that. You know, this program is very caffeinated and very um, high energy. So it, it does make people. Um, if you didn't love de being on deadline before, you you will you'll you'll get into it. Uh, I'm uh, my colleagues are have, have uh, different strengths and different backgrounds. The, the Dean of Career Services, Ju Julie Hartenstein, is a long, long time producer at ABC News. And uh, Elena Cabral is also on our team. And she was a long time re reporter at the Miami Herald and an editor at Scholastic. And Elizabeth, Isabella Rutkowski is also on our team. And she came, comes to us from Consumer Reports. Isabella and Elena are graduates of, of the J School as well. So you can read our bios on the site if you want more details. Um, using our connections in the journalism world and our knowledge of what editors are looking for, having been reporters ourselves, and, um, and also we can't forget the school's extremely loyal and powerful alumni network whose member, members conveniently occupy a lot of places of power in, in newsrooms, we are able to guide our students to into their, their first job or internship after graduation. And then, frankly, we're available to our alums, you know, forever. I've had like several, I've had a couple visits of people just this last week who were, who took, had taken a long gap, a long, you know, break from journalism, you know, raising a family and they were coming back. So, you know, we really are sort of available to you for, forever. Let me just say, though, there, there's no guarantee of a job at the end of this program. And um, there, no that's how journalism is. It's not like the law school where you sign up in freshman year, I mean, your first year, and you know where you're going to be working your last year. It's not like that. It's a very cap capricious, you know, field. So a lot of work is expected of our students in terms of, your, of, of the job search when you get here. That said, our students do really well in the job market. And we, um, we do have, and that's regardless of the flux in the industry, that's regardless of what, what the, you know, the recession that we just came out of, our students did well, no matter what. And um, I'm gonna share with you some of our employment figures so you understand the, the, um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you. Now, as I talk about employment figures, I want you to understand that we, we take our measure of, uh, we, of, of employment upon graduation day or in, in the weeks like surrounding graduation. And that is because we, that's the only way that we can get 100% compliance uh, because we hold graduation tickets over your heads before, you know, you fill out, before you, we, um, before you get graduation tickets, you have to fill out this form that, that um, at, after, gra at graduation telling us what you're going to do. So um, you need to know that because this is the only school at Columbia that takes its measure at graduation. For instance, the law school, has like 100% employment, but their measure is 11 months out. Other schools at Columbia have a different measure. So as you interrogate graduate programs that you're considering, you need to, to ask, this, ask this question. You say you, say you have this percentage when, as of when. It's a really important question. Okay, um, so at the end of the school year, nearly 74% of the class had um, post-graduation plans lined up. People are adults at this program. So what I mean is they went into internships, jobs, part-time jobs, they went back to school for another degree, they took a, a contract position, or they were really committed to being a freelancer and they had assignments lined up. And that's, it's, it's, a, it's a many categories, and this is because we're dealing with, you know, a grown-up population who can do what, whatever you want. So within this, within um, 
there are within the groups of, of the school, we've got numbers, the numbers will sort of shift up or down. I'm just going to share a, the general gist. The, the MAs did slightly better at 77%. The US citizens and green card holders did, did uh, slightly better too at about 76%. The international students came in a little bit lower at 71%, but other years they've done better. It's, it's all very, I don't know, it sort of just goes up, up like this, uh, up and down. Our native Spanish speakers were 100% um, employed and, and so on. Then throughout the summer what happens is we hear from students because we're in very close contact with with people especially in that six month period after graduation. So the numbers climb throughout the throughout the summer. So as, a, as an, ex, an example anecdotally two MAs were hired by Politico's new operation in Europe. That happened in June. One of them was a German national who was a phenomenal reporter. He got the job in the, in the Berlin Bureau of Politico. And since he's arrived, he's been covering the, the migration crisis like every day. The other student was an, was an Italian in the MA politics program who was um, set up in Brussels to report on healthcare, even though her area of expertise was energy. And, uh, and so she was, she was really thrilled to get that job. She was an investigative reporter. We had a few students um, end up in various capacities at the New York Times as researchers or news assistants. We had a digital content producer at the Daily News get uh, land a job like in, in, in July or uh, one of the MS students was hired at, at a, a, a Anderson Cooper 360. So this happens all, all throughout the year and we're continuing to hear, to hear from a, a, a few people. So you should have received a handout that was on the table downstairs and it lists the 127 companies that hired our students as of graduation day. And I want to draw your attention to the back of that sheet because this is the, you know, on, on the back of the sheet I, I've written, you know, companies that hi have hired multiples of our students. So I love this, this, these, this part of this um, sheet because it really shows you the, it's a, it's a good measure of the Columbia brand. There are a lot of companies out there who definitely come to Columbia looking for people. They prefer Columbia and they, you know, they're looking for, they, they've come to expect a certain quality of student from Columbia and that's why they come back over and over again. So they look for your language skills. They, look f they know that you've been trained really well. They know that your professors are, are all phenomenal. They know that you're all the best and the brightest from the best universities in, in the world. So, they, they come back over and over again. And then meanwhile, there's the factor of the alumni. There are so many alumni in positions of power in American newsrooms today. The executive producer at Frontline is an alum. You know, just two weeks ago, I had a question for the, the um, internship coordinator at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I said, hey, we're going to have a few students applying. Um, I just wanted to give you a heads up. And he says, oh, I really look forward to it. Signed, Ken Foskett, class of uh, 1988. So I didn't even know, you know. So they're, they're, really, they're really everywhere. Um, the an internship coordinator at the New York Times is a, uh, is a graduate of one of the programs here, which we hope translates into more, even more positions at the Times. We have close to 20 students, 20 grads at BuzzFeed. We have, a, we have a close to that at, at Huffington Post. We have about a half a dozen people at Vice. These are all new operations. So these are, these are recent, um, recent grads. Let me talk, to, talk about BuzzFeed, because everybody wants to work for Buzzfe BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed, ha as you know, has been doing a lot of hiring. Um, they've been beefing up their news, their news teams. Our students have been getting absolutely fantastic jobs. The LGBT worldwide writer is one of our grads. The Moscow correspondent is our grad. The Af Africa's human rights reporter is our grad. The immigration reporter is our grad. The c criminal justice reporter was our grad, is our grad. And that position was created in the wake of Ferguson. And he has been f flying all over the country wherever he sees some horrible story of police malfeasance or whatever. He just parachutes in and does this great, you know, three, th three 4,000 word cover story. So. We've got the, the France editor is our grad, the America's editor is our grad. It really is. Um, the tech reporter is our grad. I keep thinking of people randomly, but there are a lot of, of, of students at, at BuzzFeed from Columbia. So comp companies do like our students and do, do come here and, and hire them throughout the year. So there are several waves of hiring that happen 
in the cycle of the school. This is going to be true for any, for any school. In the beginning of the year, the first semester, people apply for, for, for the fall internship deadlines for summer, the, the next following summer. The reason why people with lots of experience will apply, will get in on the internship bandwagon in the fall is because that's your big chance to get hired at New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, Reuters, and, and, and so on. All the big companies have big print and, and wire services have their deadlines in the fall. And that is why even the MA students will jump in on that. You know, the New York, the New York Times hired one of our MAs last into an internship in, in the summer. He had previously been the tech editor at Huffington Post. So it's a very high bar that is set here. If you're coming straight from undergrad without having done a professional internship, you are likely not going to be the one to get to the New York Times or the Washington Post. But there are plenty of other jobs that that our students get. Um, so next happens in the, in the early spring, we have our deadlines for all of our exclusive internships. These are, these are internships that the school has set up with companies. And the difference with our internship, our exclusive internship programs is we've gotten the companies to agree to pay you, which is a different formula that is, than is used at other schools. And we feel that this, this formula, getting them to pay you, it makes them feel more invested in you and they're more likely to hire you, hire you at the end. So we've got a couple of people at BuzzFeed right now who, um, who, are, who are still there. One's on the investigative team and one's on the data team. The editors there are former Wall Street Journal people who know all about Columbia. So we're really happy to have, to have that program. Um, as a recent addition to our, our stable of internships. Next, hap next thing that happens is the expo, which is huge. I mean, you've all heard about it. I'm sure you saw, saw it on, in the brochures. It, is, um, it has just turned into this enormous CNBC kind of um, event where just employers just flock to this thing because they want to be in the room. It, and, it, and it's, you know, we, we will have the, the legacy media and the startups and everything in between. It's a very exciting, electrifying day, and the students do really well. And dozens and dozens of jobs come out of that expo. Now, you know, a job fair is not, you don't get a, an offer at a job fair, that never happens, because you're dealing with, you're meeting somebody who doesn't necessarily have the hiring power, they need to go back to the office, you know, come Monday and talk to people. But I'm saying, like, from the job fair, dozens and dozens of students do get called in for sec second interviews and third interviews and then get, get, a, get hired. Then after the expo, there's this period of time between April 2nd and the end of the year when full-time jobs come, on, come online. Uh, this, is, this is journalism. You know how editors are. They wait till the last minute. They don't know if they had the funding. There's this mad scramble to plug, plug in, you know, um, people. So there's a, there's a bunch of people that will get jobs after after the expo and as and going into the summer that are going to be full-time jobs also you know last minute internships that open up it's odd but a lot of the big programs will suddenly have an internship opening in april because somebody has dropped out or somebody decided to go to law school and we get we benefit from that you know because uh, we'll, we'll easily be able to recommend somebody so and then continuing on through the summer there's more we don't know what the job market it's going to be like a year from now um, because of how fast digital news is changing. Some of the students that will, will get jobs that in, in a year that didn't exist today, that's how fast it's changing. So, the, you know, the question, are, you know, what are you going to ha have your goals changed? And it, it happens a lot. People change, change their goals a lot because jobs are really, really changing. So it is, it is highly... Um, Sorry, there, there, there is a constant though, regardless of the bells and whistles that you learn, and it's all great, and it's important to learn, the bedrock principles of reporting and writing are always going to be the foundation, and that's what this school excels at teaching, and that's what employers come to the job fair to hire for, and that's why employers come to Columbia all year to hire our students. So we know that you make a huge investment of money and time in this school, and we take your, your, your career dreams and aspirations really seriously. So if you come here, you will, get, you will get a lot of guidance from us, not just while you're here, but, but you know, after, after you leave. So I wanted to just um, tell you that, and if you have any questions, I, I can answer questions. What, journalists? 
<laughs> okay. I have just one question. I'm kind of curious about um, how many of your graduates end up going into PR versus journalism, or do you see that a lot? Not really. Uh, every so often, the, some students will, you know, one or two students want to work at the UN. Um, it's really hard to get hired at the UN, so, uh, but we do have, you know, connections over there. We don't do a lot in our office. We don't do a whole lot of work making contacts in the PR world. It's just not worth our while because it's literally like one or two people a year. So, thanks. Although those students who do want to do that get jobs because this that, this degree has a lot of you know um, weight. How about salaries? You want to know about salaries? Okay. <laughs> Do you see students going into journalism startups? Sorry? Do you see students going into journalism startups? Yes. Uh, there's, a, there's a few every year who try that. And in response to that, there's a lot of guidance that you can, can get at Columbia to do that. The Tau Center has a lot going on in the entrepreneur space. They'll give you, they'll expose you to the, the vocab and the people that you need to meet and know to launch a startup. Um, there's a, we, we do have, a, have a, a site on our, a page on our site that, that lists all the people who have done this recently. Um, but yeah, it's, it's becoming more of a, of a thing amongst students. I don't know if you know, Columbia is one of the, one of the centers of gravity for entrepreneur, media entrepreneurship in the city of New York. And, and there's something called the New, New York City Media Lab downtown, which is a collaboration of NYU and Columbia, and this is where people go to sort of bounce their ideas off of successful me media entrepreneurs. So it's something that you can take advantage of starting now. Um, generally, what percentage of international students are able to find like long-term employment in the U.S., and what sort of challenges do they face doing um, that? I, I, don't, I don't know the exact numbers. I do know that it's really hard to, find, to get someone to sponsor you. Um, our students all get an OPT, one year, a one-year green card, basically, that allows you to work. The trouble with, 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 the, um, with being an international student here at Columbia is that um, there, are, there are very few news companies that will decide to keep you, you know, sponsor you long term, unless you come with extremely valuable skills like, like your language, languages that they need or digital, um, uh, like data, data skills. So, that's, that's going to be the most likely scenario is that you go back. Um, when our students go back, they get really good jobs. <laughs> so um, that's something to, to, to look at when you look at the list of where people have been. You know what else? Go on LinkedIn and search Columbia Journalism School grads in whatever country that you're from. And you'll, you'll see that, you know, you'll s just get a sense of where people are landing. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak specifically to the job prospects for investigative reporting and whether that's a growing field or it really shrinking. is. It's it's in high demand now. Now it, the Stabile students do really well in the job market, um, and it's not because you're going to be hired doing investigative after school. It's really not a re like a reasonable expectation for the new kid in the newsroom to be the investigative reporter, but the, but the skill set that you learn. As, as an investigative re reporter, you know, the document digging and the data mining that you're taught how to do and the, inter the interrogating that you're taught how to do has, is, is very valuable to employers. And, they, and they, they do like, they like the stories that you work on while you're here. And they, um, they, they do like to, like to hire the Stabiles. Thank you. Now, if you, if you don't get into the Stabile program, there are other investigative, program, uh, investigative classes that are also really powerful at, at the school. So just wanted to say that. Hi, I was wondering how competitive are the fellowships? They're very competitive. We had, um, the, the, for instance, Fusion, 75 people applied, BuzzFeed, same thing. Um, there, there were about maybe 50 slots altogether. So, you know, some of them are not as competitive as others. <laughs> Just depends. Okay. But I mean, the front line was really competitive too. That had, a, you know, like every, all the investigative students applied for that. And, 
I'm not sure if you have any data on this, but as far as students doing the part-time program who already have a job, after they yeah. complete their degree, are, are they getting raises? Are they getting promotions? Yes, they yeah. are. Okay. I don't have the exact figures. I do know that the part-time students do um, just as well, if not better, in the job market because they, um, they've had time to maybe intern you know, dur during their year. Uh, we have, you know, most of, most of the part-time students, in, in all honesty, do sort of transition back, uh, go back into their old job for a while, and the simple reason is you've, you've had an employer um, who's been willing to let you right, yeah. <laughs> go to school full-time and cut out early from work and all this, and, you know, there's a real sense of obligation, and sometimes they're paying, helping to pay your way, yeah. so many of the part-time students have to go back out of obligation or, you know, illegal obligation or moral obligation. Um, but then once they go back, they, we, we frequently hear about they finally got the promotion that they were looking for, they were made editor of a section or whatever, or they transitioned completely into something else. We had a, we had a part-timer in, um, who was in PR who, t who took the investigative health reporting class in the spring. She was not a stabile, and she wanted to be an on-air reporter, and in it was, I think it was June that she got an internship at CNN in Atlanta. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, an internship. It was a low paid internship too. She took it and then at the end of that summer, she got a full time on air reporting job at a, at a station in North Carolina. So for her, it was like a home run. I mean, she would not have gotten that job if she hadn't taken, it, taken that really low paid internship at CNN. So I do wanna talk about salaries because I know that this is a concern for for you and for and for your, your generation and it should be um, most students like the most likely outcome of out of J school is going to be an internship that is th what happens after J school and it's going to be the case wherever you apply that said some internships are much better paid than others and they're all finite right so you know the thing to do is like look at look at the long term um, our students are going into internships that pay for instance CNN's like you know it's low it's like not not even ten dollars an hour but if you if you make it through then you're gonna get something at, at the end um, our students you know one G, one job always leads to another is our has been our experience looking at looking at our grads so if that's first job might be an internship you I mean I, you shouldn't use this as like your as this, as the measure of whether it's worth it to come to J school, if you've committed to be a journalist, um, the the internship is like a it's a job tryout for most editors, and they need to see you. So our students are viewed really positively in internships because a they know you're not going back to school in the fall, they know you're available, you're older, you're more experienced. That you know our students do really well getting that full time job after after the internship is over or transitioning to into another company. Um, Starting jobs, those who got starting jobs were looking at anywhere from 35 to 45,000. Um, upwards of people with a lot of experience, like the, the, it's, it's been over 100K for a, a select few. Um, people going into business journalism seem to command a, a bit of a premium, 55, 65, if you've had some experience beforehand. Um, a few students were you know, offered around 70 with not not a ton of experience but very specific you know um, di digital skills that were in, in demand so it, it is a huge range so just be aware that you know the, the people people get terrified when they hear oh you're gonna get an internship but internships are really good because <laughs> that's it, that's your big chance to be hired you know at the Wall Street Journal and they you know they pay like 750 or 800 a week well, the New York Times pays a thousand a week. It's live. It's livable most of the time. Question: Are there graduates of the journalism school who don't ultimately go into a career of journalism, but feel their education informs their work? Uh, yes, I'm thinking of. I mean, are you a, a PhD student by any chance? Because those students do all kinds of non-newsroom jobs. Um, I guess uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I met a student recently in, the, recently in the MA Arts and Culture program who really wants to teach. He's been a reporter for like a couple decades, and he just wants to 
He really wants to teach, and he's already kind of has something lined up at, um, in the Midwest. So that kind of job happens. Um, we've had a student end up at the World Bank. He was an international student from uh, Nepal, and he wanted to work in the NGO world. So he ended up, he ended up at the first at, um, I can't remember the name of it, but he's now at the World, at the world Bank. So it's not, the, it's not the rule. Most people do go into newsroom jobs. Most people get jobs doing reporting as opposed to photography or we do have a few photographers, but most people, the most likely job, do, job responsibility is, is as, a, as a reporter, as a text reporter, regardless of whether you're at a broadcast company or, or a print, a traditional print company. Does that answer? Yes. Okay. Hi. I was curious about uh, if you're not an international student but you're interested in an international career, how does that turn out for people who would like to be in that position? Well, we have a lot of students who want to go abroad and um, the, if, if you really know that you want to be a foreign correspondent in some way, you need to sort of like embrace business journalism because that is where, you know, that's the big companies that still have bureaus all over the world are the financial wires plus, plus the Associated Press. So that's what I would say to you. Now, if you want to be a you know, swashbuckling foreign correspondent traipsing through Ebola villages and stuff, that's a different um, field. And it, you know, that's, a freelance work. that's the freelance life. And that's, that's a hard life to lead. But it's very intoxicating to a certain number of students here. So they do, um, we do send students out into the world. Uh, you know, it's our preference that you don't do that without some experience under your belt, because it can be dangerous. Um, but we do have students, particularly in the MA program, who, who do that, and, um, and a certain number of, of, um, of MS students. We also, our students compete extremely well in some major scholarship competitions. The Overseas Press Club and the Foreign Press Association are two um, competitions that our students dominate, and you can look at their websites and see what I'm talking about. Thank you. Yep. Um. Hi, yeah, my uh, question actually touches on that. Um, for people who come to Columbia and then they want to do international reporting, what's the rate for, say, you said you talked freelancing, um, like where, where do, would they freelance or get jobs, per se, out of well, Columbia? Freelancing is really not very well paid. Um, so we don't, we don't encourage it until, you know, the end of the year when what's left is the, are the hardcore Free freelancers who really want to do freelancing. Um, we have, there are t you can always tap, you know, our, our alumni network and all the employers that came, come to the, the expo who uh, have foreign operations. Um, but it is, you know, the range is huge. I mean, I was just talking to a student who worked really hard on a, on a long story and they only paid her 250 bucks and it was like a high level, high level place. It's just not really a, like a viable, you know, lifestyle the you know it's a viable lifestyle if you've been at it for years and then you decide to cash in on your name and your the places where you've worked and become a freelancer thank you yep. good afternoon i'm not sure if you touched on this um scholarships that are available what kind of scholarships for prospective students do you mean, is that a financial aid question? Yes. Yes, that, that's being covered next, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, good luck in your search, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at, at Columbia. Thanks. All right, so I'm gonna talk about applications, admissions, and money. The application process itself, I'll just say right now, the application deadline for the MS, for the MA, and for the PhD, December 15th. The application deadline for the dual degree program with computer science is January 15th. The application deadline for our scholarship application is February 1st. So, what are we looking for in a student? 
We're looking for qualities that make a good journalist. And to go back to something that, that Nick Lemon had said um, about you know, things that, that people as, ask us about, and he had talked about the school being, we don't do grades here at the journalism school. We do pass-fail. Um, so when, the, I have to say that nobody has ever asked me what the average grade point average undergraduate grade point average was of the entering class ever, not once in eight years. Um, and I don't think that they're going to. Um, and we don't keep track of it. So stop worrying about what's on your transcript. Um, that said, we're looking for people with good writing skills. And this is regardless of MS, MA, PhD. We're looking for good writing skills. Also, qualities that we know make a good journalist for the MS and the MA. So things like curiosity, determination, persistence, a love for storytelling, and a passion for journalism. And I say that passion for journalism because it's the only thing we do here. The PhD students do communications, of course. But for the MS and MA students, a passion for journalism. Um, because that's what you're going to do while you're here. It's the only thing you're going to talk about while you're here unless you're talking about um, political affairs or national affairs reporting or that sort of thing. Um, you want to be interested in journalism. We're looking for that because if you don't have those qualities, the journalism school can be a miserable experience. And we're looking for people who are going to come here, be trained as good journalists, go out and get good journalism jobs. We're not looking for people to be miserable. Um, and so that is, those are things that we're looking for when we look at the application. The application itself has several essays that you write, autobiographical, essays about your interest in journalism. If you are applying to one of the specialization areas, whether documentary, data, investigative in the MS program, or arts and culture, business, politics, or science and environment and medicine in the MA program, you'll write a third essay. We want your, your resume, an up-to-date resume. We want your transcripts from every university you ever attended. So even though you took two semesters and you think that those courses are listed on the transcript of the school that you got your bachelor's degree from, get the other transcript too. We look for three letters of reference. Who should they be from? People who have supervised your work. So if you've been working in journalism, editors. People who have been supervising your work, not your colleague who's sitting at the desk next to you that you sometimes do work with, or not a colleague that you have worked on a film or a documentary or a television um, news segment. Somebody who has supervised your work, whether it's in journalism, whether it's in banking, whether it's in law, whether it's in medicine, um, if you are coming directly from undergraduate school or from another graduate program, faculty members whose courses you have taken and who have given you grades, those are also good choices. Choices that you can leave out, and I am saying this because I see this every single year, your parents, your grandparents, your siblings, um, there are, every now and again, there's somebody who is working for a parent. So there's a family company, they're working directly for one of their parents. If that's your situation, come talk with me individually, we'll figure something else out. Um, but anyway, you want people who can comment on those qualities that we're interested in and that we're looking for. Um, who can comment about your writing, who can comment about your commitment to journalism. So when you are making those requests of people to write reference letters for you, 
give them some help. Give them a copy of the journalism essay that you write. Give them a copy of your resume, especially if they were somebody you worked for several years ago, a faculty member who has not had you in class in three or four years, remind them of who you are. Um, faculty members, you can also give them a transcript, um, depending on what you want to do. So make sure that you give them the help they need to write the very best letter of reference possible for you. We also ask for clips. Um, if you've been working in journalism, clips of work you've done can be print, they can be audio, they can be video, um, they can be digital clips, um, they can be links to your work. It should be work that only you have produced. Um, if you have not been working in journalism, you might have blog, a blog that you keep, you might have, I had um, one student two years ago who had been a financial analyst. So he had reams of things that he had written, but it was all financial analysis. But he used those. We're looking for examples of how you write, and the application gives you the opportunity to give us several examples. So the essays that you write about yourself, about your interest in journalism, the clips that you provide, um, and for the people who are applying to the MS program, we also give a 90-minute writing test um, that's divided into three 30-minute sections. There are short answer, like three-sentence answer questions, longer form questions as well, so that we get an idea of what you do when you write carefully, you probably have an editor look at your work, and what happens when you sit down at the keyboard and type something quickly, as you would be doing in the situation that Dean Lemon described, um, where you know an editor sent you out in the morning to the fire, and you had to come back and have that written and ready to go by 6 o'clock. Um, so that's a little bit what the writing test is like. Um, to prepare for it, not a whole lot you can do to prepare for it, um, except work on your writing, basically. Um, it is based in current events, so pay attention to local, national, international news um, in your country, in this country, um, for the international news. Keep an eye perhaps on the New York Times, The Economist, um, organizations that do really good international coverage. There are not going to be gotcha questions, so we're not going to say who are the nine Supreme Court justices um, of here in the United States. You can look that up. We have an internet now. There's a test floating around out on the internet that's from 2003. We gave that test up years and years and years ago. It also has a map test on it. Um, don't worry about that. We're not going to do that to you. This is going to be a writing test. Um, and you shouldn't be intimidated by it. For um, other tests, no GRE. Don't send it. Don't send us the GRE. If you're paying money to take it, use your money to send it to any other school that you're applying to. We don't use the GRE. We actually prefer not to have it in your application. The GRE scores show they have no bearing on who's going to be a good journalist. There's no correlation. Um, send it, however, if you are applying to the doctoral program the dual degree program with computer science um, or SEPA, the dual degree program with SEPA. Um, for the business school, if you're applying to the dual degree program with the business school, so you need to submit the GMAT. And of course, if you're applying to the law school, the dual degree program at law, you need the LSAT. But if you're applying to the 10 month MS, the part-time MS, or the nine-month MA program, no need for any standardized tests like the GRE, unless you are an international student and English is not your first language. In that case, you need to submit either TOEFL 
or IELTS scores. The IELTS test is the British Council exam. We do accept both exams. I'm going to stop right there and see if there are any questions about the application or the application process. Um, I wonder if you could speak to the biographical essay, maybe give us an example or two of a successful one. The sure, yeah. sure. What we're looking for, and you can think about your whole application in this way. We want to know who you are. We want to know why you're interested in journalism, or if you're applying to the doctoral program, why you're interested in a doctoral program in communications. And we want to know why you want to do your studies at Columbia. Because what we are looking for as readers is a good fit. You know, we want to look at your academic and professional goals and see if what we're offering here is appropriate for what you're looking for. So to the point of public, public relations, if there's somebody who's been working in public relations, what we need to understand from that person is why they're making the switch into journalism. Um, outline that for us. If you are applying to the doctoral program, we want to know what you're looking for. The doctoral program trains people to be university professors and researchers. Um, our doctoral students also go to work in think tanks, um, places like McKinsey, things like that. Um, but we want to see the fit between you and the program. Um, so think about your application actually as your chance to tell us your story. Um, we're looking for something that makes sense, that hangs together, um, and that lets us know who you are and why you want to be here. You don't need to go into great depth about um, having been anorexic eight years ago, um, unless it has some bearing on your application. Unless it has some bearing on your application. Um, we're looking at your ability to tell a story about yourself. So think about it in that way. Other questions? Uh, so kind of technical, but uh, with regards to transcripts, uh, so do you want the uh, uh, signed and sealed version of the transcripts uh, at the time of application, or is that uh, after you've been accepted? Great question. Um, colleges and universities, until very recently, always wanted the signed, sealed transcript. We have recently changed our application system so that when you apply, you upload with the application your essays, your resume, your clips, regardless of the kind of clip it is, whether it's print, audio, um, film, whatever it is, um, and you upload your transcripts. What I want to see in the transcripts is every single course that you ever took at university and the marks that you received. So if the course does not have a grade next to it or a mark, you need to get the transcript from the university where you took that other course. If you are admitted, at that point we will ask you for the sealed transcripts and also for final transcripts, because there are many people who come here um, who, at the time of application, are still finishing either an undergraduate or perhaps another graduate degree. Next question. Hello. Oh, let me say one other thing, um, sorry, about the transcripts. People have, be because we allow students to upload the transcripts, Make sure when you upload your transcript that it is legible. What I have seen a lot of is that people take um, a photographic image of their transcript and then they scan that in and upload it. Be careful of those. Um, they are very difficult to read. Um, so after you've uploaded things, go back, look at it, 
make sure that it's legible. Sometimes those photographic images too, if you have a folded piece of paper, and if that paper is not flat, we can't see the courses and the grades around the edges. So be very careful about that. Go ahead. So this is probably a situational question, but uh, for those considering the MS program, if you're unsure of whether to do the full-time or the part-time, and it depends on the situation, like if you're, say for instance, you are currently at a job, uh, but you know it, that your position is going to be terminated soon, and uh, you know that the, obviously the part-time program starts earlier, full-time program starts later. What do you suggest regarding that? Uh, is there any way around it? Can you apply for both? Is that a possibility? I thought this was completely crazy when I first came to work here. Um, how, but you must apply for one or the other. And the reason for that is once the class is admitted and we know who's coming, those reporting sections that people were describing we try to keep those at 14 students each. Um, and so we are admitting with that in mind. So do I want to get 16 of those sections? Do I want 14 of them? Um, and in part-time or in full-time? I'm aiming for two, possibly three, not usually, part-time sections to start in May. Um, so I want somewhere between 28 and 32, 34 students. So you need to make a decision. Um, that said, you need to make a decision at the time of application. We have had students come to us after they've been admitted to say, ah, I really want to be full-time or I really want to be part-time. Please, please, please let me do it. What we do is we put you on a waiting list to see. And if I get four part-time students and four full-time students who want to switch, or two and two, I switch them. But I've got to have an even flip. So it's possible. Um, the other possibility, since your situation may be fluid, is you start in the part-time program if you've been admitted to part-time. Your job gets eliminated during the summer. Um, you can switch to full-time in the fall. It's not unusual for students to switch at that point for many different reasons, family reasons, work reasons, all sorts of things. And it's also possible that full-time students will switch into part-time after the first semester. So those are all possibilities. Thank you. Hi, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what the or admissions committee would be looking specifically for in candidates for the investigator program. I would say the same kinds of qualities that I've described, but lo we're looking for motivation about why, what's your interest in investigative. Um, but also those qualities of determination, persistence, curiosity, um, an interest in data is helpful because investigative journalists do a lot of work with, with data, with public records. And that's not to say that journalists don't do that in general, um, but investigative journalists um, pay some specific attention there. Any other questions about the application? Hi, I was wondering if you're an international student but have gone to university in the US, do you still have to give the TOEFL? If you have attended all four years of university in an English language medium, yeah. you do not have to take it. Uh, I had another question. Uh, do you, uh, I know you said the grades, you don't really put that much importance on it, um, like in the GPA, but if your GPA was affected by a course that you took out of interest, as opposed to something you're taking towards your major, does that, do you take that into consideration? Yes, and I should say that we are interested in the grades that you've received. Because when we look at an application, it tells us a lot of things, and a transcript can tell us a lot of things. I can look at a transcript and tell you who had trouble and when, 
um, and I can even make guesses about what happened. So that if I have somebody who comes in their first year at university, disaster, 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 for whatever reason. But if I see the grades going steadily up, 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 that is going to be reassuring for me. Because then I look at that and I say, had some trouble getting used to being in university, studying, producing university level work. If I see somebody whose grades tank in their sophomore, so in their second or third years you know, of a four year bachelor's degree program, but if I see that it goes back up again the last year, I know that there's some thing that happened in that person's life, but that they got it under control. Because when I see the grades go back up, I know that whatever it was, they fixed it. Or they got it to a point where they were able to work with it and focus and concentrate on their studies again and do well in their studies. If I see grades that go like this, so, you know, like a sine curve, um, then I look at that and I say, what is that person doing to cause their grades to go like that? Um, are they focusing just on the courses in their major because that's all they're interested in? Um, is it because they've been working on the school newspaper and they've been spending too much time on the school newspaper. So I'm looking for an answer to, to that sort of thing. Um, so grades are important because of the story that they tell and the questions that they raise for me. Um, grades that do that sign curve thing, um, grades where the person only excels in the coursework from their major make me nervous. Um, and that is because journalists have to be interested in everything. Um, it's one of the, the hallmarks, I think, of a journalist, is that they want to know. They want to know, they want to know, they want to know why. You know that question four-year-olds always ask? Why? Journalists never stop asking that question. Um, so we want to know why. We want to know why. And of course, if your grades, you know, are, if you're doing well the whole time, that's great. That's not a problem. Um, but it's important that we see consistency. I guess that's what I would say. Or understand if we don't see consistency within your application, why it's not there. Other questions? Um, when it comes to the application process, is leadership something um, that matters to you? I, um, for example, being an RA resident assistant, um, part of the Dean's Council, and um, being on the Dean's list for all semesters? Leadership always matters, um, so any evidence of that is important. It's important that we see it either in your resume, um, on your transcript, um, or that if you're writing, if it's pertinent to what you're writing about in one of your essays, then yes. Yeah. What if you um, graduated from undergrad a few years ago? How, what, do you, what, do you, what kind of things are you looking for in between graduation and our application? We get students who come to us at all points in their lives. So we have people who come directly from undergraduate school. We have people who go out and do other things for a few years, work, whether as a journalist, um, whatever it is, and then decide to come to journalism school. I also have students who come from other careers, long careers. Um, the age range in the classroom here is normally between 21 and 60. That's not unusual. My oldest student this year is 64 had a long career as a lawyer. Um, and so we're just interested in what you've been doing. Um, and if it's pertinent to your interest in journalism, a little something about that as well. 
other questions about the application, the application process. I'm going to talk quickly about money. It's expensive here. You already know that. Um, the best way to deal with that is to start your financial planning right now, even before you file your admissions application. There are, I would say that almost all of the students who come here use a combination of ways to fund their application, personal funds, journalism school scholarship funds, other third party scholarship funds, and if they are US citizens or permanent residents, federal student loans. Almost everybody here has a federal student loan. Um, and there are also international students here who have private loans um, that they have gotten. So it's important that you start thinking in that way. If you look on our website, on the prospective students website under the tuition and fees section, you will also find um, a section that says outside scholarships. It's a link on the right hand side of that page. We've got a big, big spreadsheet of third party scholarships, um, many, many different categories available to all sorts of um, people, domestic students, international students, students who are interested in political writing, students who, or, or applicants who are members of um, one of the national affinity groups, whether it's the National Association um, of Hispanic Journalists, whether it's NABJ, whatever it might be, um, scholarships for students who are at Greek churches. It can be all sorts of things. You should always file the J School scholarship application. February 1st is the deadline. Um, and look for the other money. Look for the other money. I suggest that you make a spreadsheet for yourself of the other money that you're going to apply for. Put the deadline dates. Um, put what it is that you have to submit. Um, who the contact person is, the contact information, how you have to do it, so that you can keep track of what you have to do and by when. Um, I've had, I had a student two years ago who decided that she was not paying for her education here. She went out and found outside funding and applied for all kinds of things, and she did it. She graduated um, having used third-party funding. For international students, we also list scholarships on that outside funding list for international students. Look to your um, governments in your own countries. Um, many governments offer funding that you can apply for. Um, the DAAD in Germany, um, the Peruvian, Chilean, Argentine, Brazilian, um, Colombian governments all offer um, special funding. Um, there for students coming from India, look into Inlux funding. Also international students look into Fulbright funding, uh, which is US-based funding. Um, there are lots of possibilities. Look everywhere. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, kind of technical about the application itself. Uh, what, what style guide do you guys prefer? For the application itself, we don't have a style guide re uh, requirement. However, the journalism school for its classes and the classroom work uses the AP style guide. Other questions? Yes. Are all scholarships needs based? I would say that the majority of the journalism school scholarship funds are need-based. There are others that are based on the requirements that or restrictions that the donor has set um, so that they can be merit-based. They can be um, for students who want to do science journalism, political journalism, students from Oregon, students from um, Ohio, students from Washington, D.C., um, all sorts of things. Apply. Submit the scholarship application. Check off all the boxes that apply for you. Um, 
and then there are others too where um, there are specific things that we know we have to look for apply and whatever you do please don't come to me in April and say can I please apply now and I because I'll say yes you can apply and we'll reopen the scholarship application for you but the money will have been given out at that point so February 1st scholarship deadline for the J school US citizens if you're applying for journalism school scholarships you also need to submit the FAFSA that opens uh, the 1st of January. Submit that as well before the 2nd of, uh, before the 1st of February. Other questions? Have we exhausted you? <laughs> there are a number of us who will be here, including, I see Ko is still there, John, um, I don't, and Hassan is also still there. If you would like to talk with any of us, um, you're very welcome to. Thank you again, those of you on the live stream. Thank you for having joined us. We're delighted that you're here. And Sheila Coronel had also mentioned that if you are here in New York City and are interested in sitting in on a class, please contact the admissions office. Um, and my colleague David Hooker will be very happy to help you arrange that sort of thing. Thanks again.